Mary Black. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for calling me during such an important debate. Firstly, in my maiden speech, I want to pay tribute to my predecessor, Douglas Alexander. He served the constituency for many years. After all, I was only three when he was elected. <laughs> <laughs> but it is because of that fact that I want to thank him for all he did for the constituency. And I especially want to take a moment to commend him for the dignified way that he handled himself on what must have been a very difficult election night. He did himself proud and he did his party proud and I wish him yeah, the best yeah. for the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, when I discovered that it was of tradition to speak about the history of your constituency in a maiden speech, I decided to do some research, despite the fact I've lived there all my life. And I, I, as one of the tail end doing the maiden speech uh, of my colleagues in the SNP, I've noticed that my colleagues quite often mention Rabbi Burns a lot, and they all try to form this intrinsic connection between him and their own constituency and own him for themselves. I, however, feel no need to do this, for during my research I discovered a fact which trumps them all. William Wallace was born in my constituency. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker is familiar with. Now, my constituency has a fascinating history far beyond a Hollywood film and a historical name. From the mills of Paisley to the industries of Johnson, right out to the weavers in Kilbarkin, it's got a wonderful population with a cracking sense of humour and much to offer both to tourists and to those who reside there. But the truth is that within my constituency, it's not all fantastic. We've watched our town centres deteriorate. We've watched our communities decline. Our unemployment level is higher than that of the UK average. One in five children in my constituency go to bed hungry at night. Paisley Job Centre has the third highest number of sanctions in the whole of Scotland. Now, before I was elected, I volunteered for a charitable organisation, and there was a gentleman who I grew very fond of. He was one of these guys who has been battered by life in every way imaginable. You name it, he's been through it. And he used to come in to get food from this charity and it was the only food that he had access to and it was the only meal he would get and I sat with him and he told me about his fear of going to the job centre he said I've heard the stories Mary they, they try and trick you out they, they'll tell you you're a liar I'm not a liar Mary I'm not and I told him it's okay calm down go be honest it'll be fine I then didn't see him for about two or three weeks I did get very worried and when he finally did come back in I says to him how did you get on and without saying a word, he burst into tears. That grown man standing in front of a 20-year-old, crying his eyes out. Because what had happened to him was the money that he would normally use to pay for his travel to come to the charity to get his food. He decided that in order to afford to get to the job centre, he would save that money. Because of this, he didn't eat for five days. He didn't drink. When he was on the bus on the way to the job centre, he fainted due to exhaustion and dehydration. He was 15 minutes late for the job centre and he was sanctioned for 13 weeks. If we, now, when the Chancellor spoke in his budget about fixing the roof while the sun is shining, I would have to ask, on who is the sun shining? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he spoke about benefits, not supporting certain kind of lifestyles, is that the kind of lifestyle that he was talking about? If we go back even further, when the Minister for Employment was asked to consider if there was a correlation between the number of sanctions and the rise in food bank use, she stated, and I quote, food banks play an important role in local welfare provision. Renfrewshire has the third highest use of food bank use, and food bank use is going up and up. Food banks are not part of the welfare state. They are a symbol that the welfare state is failing. Now, the government quite rightly pays for me through taxpayers' money to be able to live in London whilst I serve my constituents. My housing is subsidised by the taxpayer. Now, the Chancellor in his budget said, it is not fair that families earning over £40,000 in London should have their rents paid for by other working people. But it is OK so long as you're an MP. Yeah. In this budget, the Chancellor also abolished any housing benefit for anyone below the age of 21. So we are now in the ridiculous situation whereby, because I am an MP, not only am I the youngest, but I am now also the only 20-year-old in the whole of the UK that the Chancellor is prepared to help with housing. We now have one of the most uncaring, uncompromising and out-of-touch governments that the UK has seen since Thatcher. It is here that I must now turn to those who I share a bench with. 
Now, I have sat in this chamber for 10 weeks, and I have very deliberately stayed quiet, and I have listened intently to everything that has been said. I have heard multiple speeches from Labour benches standing to talk about the worrying rise of nationalism in Scotland, when in actual fact all these speeches have served to do is to demonstrate how deep the lack of understanding about Scotland is within the Labour Party. I, like so many SNP members, come from a traditional socialist Labour family, and I have never been quiet in my assertion that I feel it is the Labour Party that left me, yeah. not the other way about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The SNP did not triumph on a wave of nationalism. In fact, nationalism has nothing to do what's, with what's happened in Scotland. Mm -hmm. We triumphed on a wave of hope. Mm -hmm. Hope that there was something different, something better to the Thatcherite neoliberal policies that are produced from this chamber. Mm -hmm. Hope yeah. that representatives genuinely could give a voice to those who don't have one. I don't mention this in order to pour salt into wounds, which I am sure are very open and very sore for many members on these benches, both politically and personally. Colleagues, possibly friends, lost their seats. I mention it in order to hold a mirror to the face of a party that seems to have mm. forgotten the very people they're supposed to represent, the very things they're supposed to fight for. After hearing the Labour leader's intentions to support the changes of tax credits that the Chancellor has put forward, I must make this plea through the words of one of your own and one of a personal hero of mine. Tony Benn once said that in politics there are weathercocks and signposts. Weathercocks will spin in whatever direction the wind of public opinion may blow them, no matter what principle they have to compromise. And then there are signposts. Signposts which stand true and tall and principled, and they point in a direction and they say, this is the way to a better society, and it is my job to convince you why. Tony Benn was right when he said, the only people worth remembering in politics were signposts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah. yes, we will have political differences. Yes, in other parliaments, we may be opposing parties, but within this chamber, we are not. No matter how much I may wish it, the SNP is not the sole opposition to this government, but nor is the Labour Party. Yeah. It is together with all the parties on these benches that we must form an opposition. And in order to be effective, we must oppose, not abstain. Yeah. So I reach out a genuine hand of friendship, which I can only hope will be taken. Let us come together. Let us be that opposition. Let us be that signpost of a better society. Ultimately, People are needing a voice. People are needing help. Let's give them it. Yeah.